Good morning. This is the recorded lecture for acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease. Kidney failure is a condition in which the kidneys are unable to effectively remove the accumulated metabolites from the blood which lead to altered fluid, electrolyte, and acid base balance. The cause could be due to a primary kidney disorder or it can occur secondary to a systemic disease or other urologic defects. The onset of kidney failure for patients can be either acute or chronic. When we talk about acute kidney injury, we're talking about a very abrupt onset and with prompt intervention, it can be reversible. Chronic kidney disease which may culminate in kidney failure, develops slowly and insidiously, often producing few symptoms until the kidneys are severely damaged and unable to meet the excretory needs of the body. Acute kidney injury and the final stages of chronic kidney disease are characterized by azotemia, increased levels of nitrogenous waste in the blood. The kidneys are the principal organs of the urinary system. The primary functions of the kidneys are to regulate the volume and composition of extracellular fluid and to excrete waste products from the body. The kidneys also function to control the patient's blood pressure. They produce erythropoietin, they activate vitamin D, and regulate the acid-base balance. The nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Each kidney contains approximately one million nephrons. Each nephron is composed of the glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, and a tubular system. The tubular system consists of the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting tubules. Glo the glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, proximal tubule, and distal tubule are located in the cortex of the kidney. The loop of Henle and collecting tubules are located in the medulla. Several collecting tubules join to form a single collecting duct. The ducts eventually merge into a pyramid that empties via the papil papilla into a minor calyx. Urine formation begins at the glomerulus, where blood is filtered. The glomerulus is a semi-permeable membrane that allows filtration. The hydrostatic pressure of the blood to be filtered across the semi-permeable membrane into the Bowman's capsule where the filtered portion of the blood begins to pass down to the tubule. Filtration is more rapid in the glomerulus than in ordinary tissue capillaries because the glomerular membrane is porous. The ultrafiltrate is similar in composition to blood except that it lacks blood cells, platelets, and large plasma proteins. Under normal conditions, the capillary pores are too small to allow the loss of these large blood components. In many kidney diseases, however, the capillary permeability is increased, which permits plasma proteins and blood cells to pass into the urine. The amount of blood filtered each minute by the glomeruli is expressed as the glomerular filtration rate. The normal GFR is about 125 mL per minute. Since the glomerular membrane is a selective filtration membrane that filters primarily by size, provision is made for the reabsorption of essential materials and the excretion of non-essential. The tubules and collecting ducts carry out these functions by means of reabsorption and secretion. Reabsorption is the passage of a substance from the lumen of the tubules through the tubule cells and into the capillaries. This process involves both active and passive transport. Tubular secretion is the passage of a substance from the capillaries through the tubular cells into the lumen of the tubule. 
reabsorption and secretion cause numerous, cause numerous changes in the composition of the glomerular filtrate as it moves through the entire length of the tubule. Other important functions include the regulation of water balance and acid-base balance. Antidiuretic hormone is required for the water to be reabsorbed in the kidney and is important in water balance. Aldosterone, which is released from the adrenal cortex, acts on distal tubules to cause reabsorption of sodium and water. In exchange for sodium, potassium ions are excreted. Acid-base regulation involves the reabsorbing and conserving of most of the bicarbonate and secreting excess hydrogen ions. The tubules are also involved in your calcium balance. The parathyroid hormone is released from the parathyroid gland in response to low serum calcium levels. PTH maintains serum calcium ions and decreased tubular reabsorption of phosphate ions. In kidney disease, the effects of PTH may have a major effect on bone metabolism. Vitamin D the hormone that can be obtained in the diet or synthesized by the action of ultraviolet radiation on cholesterol in the skin. These forms of vitamin D are inactive and require two more steps to become meta metabolically active. The first activation occurs in the liver and the second occurs in the kidneys. Active vitamin D is essential for the absorption of calcium from the GI tract. Patients with kidney failure, also known as renal failure, have a deficiency of the active metabolite of vitamin D and manifest problems of altered calcium and phosphate balance. When we look at how to measure normal kidney function, there are several things that are looked at. We look at serum creatinine. As this is more reliable, than the blood urea nitrogen as a determinant of renal function. Creatinine is the end product of muscle and protein metabolism and is released at a constant rate. The reference intervals for normal creatinine is 0.6 to 1.3 milligrams per deciliter. The blood urea nitrogen can be used somewhat to detect renal problems, however, the blood urea nitrogen can be elevated due to a patient being dehydrated and also if there has been a GI bleed. The reference intervals are 6 to 20 milligrams per DL. There are, again, there are a lot of non-renal factors that may cause increases such as rapid cell destruction from infections, fever, GI bleeding, trauma, any athletic activity and excessive muscle breakdown and also corticosteroid therapy can elevate the blood urea nitrogen. We look at the glomerular filtration rate or our creatinine clearance. This is looked at because creatinine is a waste product of the protein breakdown, primarily body muscle mass. The clearance of creatinine by the kidney approximates the glomerular filtration rate. We look at urine specific gravity. As this can become a very um, specific and fixed rate. In renal failure, it can become fixed at about 1.010 when your normals are 1.003 to about 1.030. Your um, possible etiology, you can have very dilute urine, you can have excessive diuresis, the patient could have diabetes insipidus when it's low, when it's high, you could have dehydration, albuminuria, neuria and glycosuria. When it is a fixed rate, renal 
system is unable to concentrate urine which leads or is pointing to end-stage kidney disease. And for the osmolality of urine, if it's <clears throat> greater than 1300, there is tubular dysfunction. Kidney lost, or the kidneys, excuse me, have lost their ability to concentrate or dilute urine. Um, this is not normally a part of a urinalysis, but some physicians may actually run it separately. Acute kidney injury, which is also known as acute renal failure, is a rapid decline in renal function, where it is noted that the patient will have azotemia and fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Serum creatinine values significantly increase over hours to days in acute kidney injury, and the urine output falls. The most common causes of acute kidney injury are ischemia, sepsis, and nephrotoxins. The kidney is particularly vulnerable because of the amount of blood that passes through it. A fall in blood pressure or volume can cause ischemia of kidney tissues. Sepsis also produces hemodynamic effects with generalized vasodilation and a fall in glomerular filtration rate. Nephrotoxins in the blood damage renal tissue directly. Approximately 5 to 7 percent of all hospitalized patients develop acute kidney injury. The incidence jumps to as much as 30 percent when you're talking about critical care and special care units. The mortality rate for acute kidney injury in seriously ill patients is 40 to 90 percent. This high death rate is probably more related to the population affected such as your older patients and the critically ill than to the actual disorder itself. Major trauma or surgery, infection, sepsis, hemorrhage, severe heart failure, liver disease, and urinary tract obstruction are risk factors for acute kidney injury. Drugs and radiologic contrast media that are toxic to the kidneys also increase the risk. Older adults develop acute kidney injury more frequently due to their higher incidence of serious illness, major surgeries, and treatment with nephrotoxic drugs. The older adult may also have some degree of pre-existing renal insufficiency that has been associated with the aging process. The causes of acute kidney injury, which can be multiple and complex, are categorized into three areas, either as pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal. Pre-renal causes of acute kidney injury are factors that are external to the kidneys. These factors actually reduce systemic circulation, causing a reduction in renal blood flow. This decrease in the blood flow leads to decreased glomerular perfusion and filtration of the kidneys. Although kidney tubular and glomerular function is preserved, glomerular filtration is reduced as a result of the decreased perfusion. It is important to distinguish prerenal oliguria from the oliguria of intrarenal acute kidney injury. In prerenal oliguria, there is no damage to the kidney tissue. The oliguria is caused by a decrease in the circulating blood volume, such as severe dehydration, uh, decreased cardiac output, and is readily reversible with appropriate treatment. With a decrease in circulating blood volume, autoregulatory mechanisms that increase angiotensin II, aldosterone, norepinephrine, and ADH attempt to preserve the blood flow to essential organs. Prerenal azotemia results in a reduction in the excretion of sodium, increased sodium and water retention, and decreased urine output. Prerenal conditions can lead to intrarenal disease if renal ischemia is prolonged. Prerenal conditions account for many cases of intrarenal acute kidney injury. If the decreased perfusion persists for an extended time, 
the kidneys lose their ability to compensate and damage can occur. When we talk about intrarenal acute kidney injury, it is characterized by acute damage to the renal parenchyma and nephrons, sepsis, prolonged ischemia, and nephrotoxins are the most common causes of intrinsic acute kidney injury, or excuse me, intrarenal. Less commonly, infectious diseases or immunologic disorders can also cause intrarenal failure. In acute glomerular nephritis, glomerular inflammation can reduce renal blood flow and cause acute kidney injury. In post-renal failure or acute kidney injury, the patient has an actual obstruction that causes the acute renal failure. Any condition that prevents urine excretion can lead to post-renal acute kidney injury. BPH is the most common precipitating factors as well as renal or urinary tract calculi and tumors. The rifle classification seen here in this slide is used to describe the stages of acute kidney injury. Risk, which is the first stage of acute kidney injury, is followed by injury, which is the second stage. In the first stage under risk, you see that you initially see an increase in the serum creatinine, or you could have a decrease of the glomerular filtration rate by 25%. However, the initial thing you're going to see is the increase in the creatinine. When there's injury, the creatinine has almost increased by 2% or by twice their um, baseline. Or they have at that time had glomerular filtration rate decreasing by 20 or excuse me, 50%. When it moves on into severity in the final or third stage, which is failure, the creatinine has increased to three times the baseline and they've had a decrease in their filtration rate by over 75 percent. By this time the serum creatinine can be as, as um, large as four milligrams per, per DL. The two outcome variables seen with the rifle staging is the variables of loss and then end-stage kidney disease. If acute kidney injury progresses and is not and has a prolonged course the patient can end up with permanent damage to the kidneys. Although mild acute kidney injury can be asymptomatic it can have significant effects on the kidneys excretory and regulatory functions. Uremia, the accumulation of toxic waste products in the body, affects multiple organs and body functions including the patient's mental status. Fluid, electrolytes, and acid-base acid balance are disrupted with initial hypervolemia, hyperkalemia, and the metabolic acidosis. However, hypovolemia may develop during the diuretic phase of acute kidney injury. Other potential complications as discussed include infections, bleeding, the cardiac complications due to the electrolyte and acid imbalance, and also malnutrition for your patient. Slide 9 goes over all the different areas that are affected by electrolyte imbalance and the acidosis that can occur. The central nervous system from the mild to severe, the GI system from mild to severe, as well as the other systems listed. In the diagnosis of acute kidney injury, it is very important to review the history and the physical on the patient and look for the identification of the precipitating cause. We also use many diagnostic tests to evaluate and confirm acute kidney injury. The serum creatinine and BUN and the um, GFR are used to evaluate the renal function in a patient. In acute kidney injury, serum creatinine levels increase rapidly within 24 to 48 hours of the onset. The BUN or creatinine ratio or the GFR is reduced and falls in acute kidney, kidney injury. 
creatinine levels will generally peak within 5 to 10 days. The creatinine and BUN levels tend to increase more slowly when urine output is maintained. The onset of recovery is marked by a halt in the rise of the serum creatinine and BUN. We also look at the serum electrolytes. These are monitored to evaluate the fluid and electrolyte status. The potassium rises at a moderate rate and is often used to indicate the need for dialysis. Hyponatremia is common due to the water excess that is associated with acute kidney injury. Arterial blood gases are often used. This will show a metabolic acidosis due to the inability of the kidneys to adequately eliminate metabolic waste and the hydrogen ions. They will also look at a CBC, which shows reduced RBCs and a moderate amount of anemia and a low hematocrit due to the effects of um, decreased erythropoietin secretion and RBC production. Along with this, iron and folate absorption can also be impaired, which further contributes to anemia. In the urinalysis, it often shows some abnormal findings, such as the fixed specific gravity of 1.010, because the tubules are unable to concentrate the um, filtrate. They may also see proteinuria, which may be significant if glomerular damage has been caused. The presence of RBCs due to the glomerular dysfunction, also white blood cells related to inflammation, and renal tubular epithelial cells can indicate acute tubular necrosis. Cell casts, which are protein and cellular debris molded in the shape of the tubul tubular lumen, can also be seen. In acute kidney injury, red and white blood cells and renal tubular epithelial casts can be present. Brownish pigmented cast and positive tests for occult blood indicate hemoglobinuria and myoglobinuria. They may also use a renal ultrasound, which identifies any obstructive causes of renal failure, and also to differentiate acute kidney injury from end-stage chronic kidney disease. In AKI, the kidneys may be enlarged, whereas typically they appear small and shrunken in chronic kidney disease. The CT scan can also be used or an MRI can be done to evaluate kidney size and also again to identify any obstructions. Biopsies can be used, but this is done to differentiate between an acute kidney injury and chronic renal failure for your patient. Our collaborative treatments, again, we are looking to eliminate the precipitating cause and to intervene. Our focus is drug management for our acute kidney injury to restore and maintain our renal perfusion and also to eliminate any drugs that are nephrotoxic from the treatment regimen. IV fluids and blood volume expanders may be given to restore renal perfusion for your patient. Dopamine may be administered in low doses by IV infusion to help increase renal blood flow as well. We will also look at doing fluid restriction as discussed in class. They are only allowed 600 mLs plus whatever their previous 24-hour fluid loss is. If restoration of the renal blood flow does not improve urinary output, the patient may be placed on a loop diuretic such as furosemide or an osmotic diuretic such as mannitol. Um, may be given with IV fluids to help manage any fluid overload. The combination of a loop diuretic and a thiazide diuretic may also be used in patients who fail to respond to a loop or osmotic diuretic. Along with this, aggressive hypertensive management limits renal injury. Whenever the acute kidney injury is associated with any kind of toxemia or pregnancy-induced hypertension, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or other antihypertensive medications can be used to help control arterial blood pressures. Any drugs that are either directly nephrotoxic or that may interfere with renal perfusion are discontinued. NSAIDs, as well as nephrotoxic antibiotics such as the aminoglycosides and any other potentially harmful drugs such as contrast media or avoided throughout the course of the acute kidney injury. 
These patients are also at risk for um, gastrointestinal bleeding, likely related to the stress response and the impaired platelet function. Regular doses of antacids, histamine H2 receptor antagonist, or a proton pump inhibitor are ordered and used to prevent GI hemorrhage. Hyperkalemia may also require active intervention as well as restricted potassium intake. Serum levels greater than 6.5 are treated to prevent cardiac effects of hyperkalemia. With significant hyperkalemia, calcium chloride, bicarbonate, and insulin and glucose may be given IV to reduce the serum potassium levels by moving potassium back into the cell. Nebulized albuterol, a beta-2 agonist, may be used in combination with insulin and glucose to reduce serum potassium levels. A potassium binding exchange resin such as sodium, um, polystyrene, sulfonate, or known as kaexalate, may also be given orally or by enema. This agent removes potassium from the body by exchanging the sodium for potassium primarily in the large intestine. Because many drugs are eliminated from the body by the kidney, drug dosages may need to be adjusted. Doses within the usual range can lead to potentially toxic blood levels because their elimination is slowed and half-life prolonged. Nursing implications for medications commonly prescribed for the patient need to be reviewed and understood by each nurse. It is very important in nursing that we monitor the patient's vital signs and fluid intake and output. Daily monitoring of a patient's urine output has prognostic implications and is crucial for determining the patient's therapy and what their daily fluid volume replacement should be. As a nurse, you should examine the urine for their color, look at your analysis for specific gravity, do they have any glucose, protein, blood, or any sediment present. Assess the patient's general appearance, including their skin color, do they have any edema present, is there any neck vein distension, and are there any bruises present. If a patient is receiving dialysis, observe the access site for any inflammation and exudate, and evaluate the patient's mental status and level of consciousness. You will need to examine their oral mucus membranes for dryness and any inflammation due to the buildup of the uremia. Auscultate lungs for crackles and ronchi or any diminished breath sounds. Monitor the heart for any um, extra sounds, murmurs, or any pericardial friction rub. And also continue to assess their ECG readings for any dysrhythmias. Do trending of lab work and diagnostic test results to look for any improvement or any additional problems that may be occurring. When we talk about health promotion, the biggest thing is prevention and early recognition of acute kidney injury. These are the most important components. Prevention is primarily directed toward identifying and monitoring high-risk populations and helping to control the exposure to nephrotoxic drugs and industrial chemicals, and also preventing any prolonged episodes of hypotension or hypovolemia for patients that are admitted or come into the hospital. In the hospital, the factors that increase any patient's risk are pre-existing chronic kidney disease, if they're older in age, if they've received massive trauma, if they've had major surgical procedures, any patient who has had extensive burns, if they have a history of cardiac failure, if they are septic, or of course obstetric complications can also lead to risk. Careful monitoring again of INO and fluid and electrolyte balance is essential for all of these types of patients. Assess and record any extra renal losses of fluid from vomiting, diarrhea, hemorrhage, and of course any increased and sensible losses such as patients who are running fevers and have excessive sweating. 
prompt replacement of these significant fluid losses is very important to help decrease the risk of hypovolemia and prevent ischemic tubular necrosis from occurring. INO records and the patient's weight provide valuable indicators of fluid volume status. Aggressive diuretic therapy for the patient with fluid overload from any cause can lead to a reduction in the renal blood flow. Any individual who's taken drugs that are potentially nephrotoxic, please refer to Table 45.3, must have his or her kidney function monitored. Nephrotoxic drugs should be used sparingly in the high-risk patient. When these drugs must be used, they should be given in the smallest dose that is effective for the shortest possible time. Caution the patient about abuse of over-the-counter analgesics, especially any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, because some of these can worsen kidney function in all patients with mild chronic kidney disease. ACE inhibitors are used to um, can also, excuse me, decrease um, perfusion pressure and cause hyperkalemia. If other measures such as diet modification, diuretics, and sodium bicarb cannot control the hyperkalemia, ACE inhibitors may need to be reduced or eliminated. However, ACE inhibitors are frequently used to prevent proteinuria and progression of kidney disease, especially for those patients who are diabetic. For patients with acute kidney injury, they are very critically ill and suffer from the effects of not only kidney disease, but also comorbid diseases or conditions. Focus on these patients needs to be holistic, since he or she will have many physical and emotional needs. Both the patient and caregiver need assistance in understanding that the whole body's functioning can be disrupted by kidney failure. Again, the important role for the nurse is managing fluid and electrolyte balance during the oliguric and diuretic phases. Observe and record accurate INOs. Make sure to do daily weights with the same scale at the same time each day to detect any excessive gains or losses of body fluid. One kilogram is equivalent to a thousand mLs of fluid. Assess for any common signs and symptoms of hypervolemia in the oliguric phase or hypovolemia during the diuretic phase. Potassium and sodium disturbances and any other electrolyte imbalances that can occur during this time. Because infection is the leading cause of death for patients who have acute kidney injury, meticulous aseptic technique is critical. You need to protect the patient from other individuals who may have infectious diseases. Be alert for local manifestations of infection such as any swelling, redness, or pain, as well as systemic manifestations such as fever, malaise, leukocytosis as well. But realize that the temperature may not always be elevated in every patient. Patients with kidney failure have a blunted febrile response to an infection. If antibiotics are used to treat an infection, the type, frequency, and dosage must be carefully considered because the kidneys are the primary route of excretion for many antibiotics. The pharmacist needs to be involved in dosing for any patient that has acute kidney injury. Skin care needs to be meticulous and take measures to prevent pressure ulcers because these patients usually develop edema and decreased muscle tone. Mouth care is very important to help prevent stomatitis, which develops when ammonia in saliva irritates the mucous membranes. Recovery from acute kidney injury is highly variable and will depend on the other organ system failures or pro that are involved. The patient's general condition and age and how long the oliguric phase lasted and how severe the nephron damage was. Protein and potassium intake should be regulated in accordance with kidney function. Follow-up care and regular evaluation of kidney function are necessary for these patients. They need to be taught the signs and symptoms of recurrent kidney disease and how to prevent the recurrence of acute kidney injury. 
Long-term convalescence can take from 3 to 12 months, and this can cause psychosocial and financial hardships for both the patient and the family. So make sure that you do appropriate ref So we're now going to talk about chronic kidney disease. Although the kidneys often recover from acute injury, many chronic conditions can lead to progressive destruction of kidney tissue and loss of function. Nephron units are lost and kidney mass decreases. With progressive deterioration of glomerular filtration, tubular secretion, and reabsorption. This process may progress slowly for many years without being recognized. Chronic kidney disease is defined as kidney damage with resulting dysfunction, meaning a glomerular filtration rate less than 60 mLs per, hour, per minute that persist for three or more months. Eventually, the kidneys are unable to excrete metabolic waste and regulate fluid and electrolyte balance adequately. A condition known as kidney failure or end-stage renal disease develops, which is the final stage of chronic kidney disease. Conditions causing chronic kidney disease typically involve diffuse bilateral disease of the kidneys with progressive destruction and scarring of the entire nephron. Acute kidney injury significantly increases the risk of chronic kidney disease. Other known risk factors include autoimmune diseases, proteinuria, or a family history of kidney disease. The pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease varies depending on the underlying disease process. Chronic kidney disease and kidney failure for the most part are the common causes of nephron destruction. Regardless of the initiating cause, glomerular sclerosis and interstitial inflammation and fibrosis are characteristic of chronic kidney disease and contribute to the declining renal function. Entire nephron units are eventually destroyed. In the early stages as nephrons are lost, remaining functional nephrons hypertrophy. Glomerular capillary flow and pressure increase in these nephrons and more solute particles are filtered to compensate for lost renal mass. This increased demand predisposes the remaining nephrons to glomerular, glomerular sclerosis, resulting in their eventual destruction. Proteinuria resulting from the glomerular damage is thought to contribute to tubular injury. This process of continued loss of nephron function may continue even after the initial disease process has resolved. The course of chronic kidney disease is variable, progressing over a period of months to many years. In the early stages, unaffected nephrons actually compensate for the ones that are lost. The GFR is normal or slightly decreased and the patient is asymptomatic with normal BUN and serum creatinine levels. As the disease progresses and the GFR falls further, hypertension and some manifestations of renal insufficiency such as fatigue, anemia, and fluid and electrolyte imbalances may be seen. Any further insult to the kidneys at this stage such as an infection, dehydration, exposure to nephrotoxins, or urinary tract obstruction can further reduce function and precipitate the onset of renal failure and uremic syndrome. The serum creatinine and BUN levels rise sharply. The patient becomes oliguric and manifestations of uremia are seen. In end-stage renal disease, the final stage, the GFR is less than 15 mLs per minute 
and renal replacement therapy is necessary to sustain life. Chronic kidney disease may not be identified until its final uremic stage is reached. Uremia or uremic syndrome, meaning urine in the blood, refers to the syndrome or group of symptoms associated with end-stage renal disease. In uremia, fluid and electrolyte balance is altered. The regulatory and endocrine functions of the kidney are impaired and accumulated metabolic waste products affect essentially every other organ system. Declining renal function is associated with progressive systemic inflammation and elevated levels of C-reactive protein and other inflammatory substances. This inflammatory response contributes to accelerated cardiovascular disease and negative nutritional impact of chronic kidney disease. Early manifestations of uremia include nausea, apathy, weakness and fatigue, symptoms that are often dismissed as a viral infection or influenza. As the condition progresses, frequent vomiting, increasing weakness, lethargy and confusion can develop. When we look at the multi-system effects, we first look at our fluid and electrolyte effects and what they have on the body. Loss of functional kidney tissue impairs its ability to regulate fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balance. In the early stages, impaired filtration and reabsorption lead to proteinuria, hematuria, and decreased urine concentrating ability. Salt and water are poorly conserved, and risk for dehydration increases. Polyuria, nocturia, and a fixed specific gravity of 1.010 are common. As the GFR decreases and renal function deteriorates further, sodium and water retention are common, necessitating salt and water restrictions. Hyperkalemia develops as renal failure progresses. Manifestations of hyperkalemia, such as muscle weakness, paresthesias, and ECG changes, are not usually seen until the GFR is less than 5 mLs per minute. Phosphate excretion is impaired, leading to hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia. Reduced calcium absorption due to impaired vitamin D activation also contributes to hypocalcemia. Elevated levels of magnesium develop with advancing renal failure. Magnesium containing antacids are avoided for this reason. As renal failure advances, hydrogen ion excretion and buffer reproduction are impaired leading to metabolic acidosis. Respiratory rate and depth actually increase and your patient will have Kuzma's respirations to compensate for the metabolic acidosis. Other possible manifestations include general malaise, weakness, headache, nausea and vomiting, and abdominal pain. When we look at the cardiovascular effects, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death for those patients with chronic kidney disease. It results from accelerated atherosclerosis. Hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and inflammation all contribute to this process. Cerebral and peripheral vascular manifestations of atherosclerosis are seen. Systemic hypertension is a common manifestation of chronic kidney disease. Hypertension results from the excess fluid volume, increased renin-angiotensin activity, increased peripheral vascular resistance, and decreased prostaglandins. Increased extracellular fluid volume can lead to edema and heart failure. Pulmonary edema may result from the heart failure and the increased permeability of the alveolar capillary membrane. 
Retained metabolic toxins can irritate the pericardial sac, causing an inflammatory response and signs of pericarditis. Cardiac tamponade is a potential complication of pericarditis. Occurs when inflammatory fluid in the pericardial sac interferes with the ventricular filling and cardiac output. Once a common complication of uremia, pericarditis is less common now when dialysis is initiated early on in the process. Anemia is also very common for chronic kidney disease patients and is caused by multiple factors. The kidneys produce erythropoietin, which is a hormone that controls red blood cell production. In renal failure, erythropoietin production declines. Retained met metabolic toxins further suppress red blood cell production and contribute to a shortened red blood cell lifespan. Nutritional deficiencies of iron and folate and inflammation with impaired Iron utilization also contribute to the patient's anemia. Anemia contributes to the manifestations of fatigue, weakness, depression, and impaired cognition. It affects cardiovascular function and may be a major contributing factor to coronary heart disease and heart failure that is associated with end-stage renal disease. Renal failure impairs platelet function, increasing the risk of bleeding disorders such as epitaxis and GI bleeding. The mechanism, of course, of impaired platelet function associated with this renal failure is not understood very well. Uremia increases the risk for a patient to get infections. The high levels of urea and retained metabolic waste impair all aspects of inflammation and immune function. The white blood cells decline, humoral and cell-mediated immunity are impaired, and phagocyte function is defective. Both the acute inflammatory response and delayed hypersensitivity responses are affected. Fever is suppressed, which often delays any diagnosis of infection for these patients. Anorexia, nausea, and vomiting are the most common early symptoms of uremia. Hiccups also are commonly experienced. Gastroenteritis is frequent for these patients. Ulcerations may affect any level of the GI tract and contribute to an increased risk of GI bleeding. Peptic ulcer disease is particularly common in patients with uremia. Uremic fetter is a urine-like breath odor often associated with a metallic taste in the mouth and can develop. Uric fetter, excuse me, uremic fetter can further contribute to anorexia in these patients. Uremia alters both central and peripheral nervous system function. CNS manifestations occur early and include changes in mental mentation, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and insomnia. Psychotic symptoms, seizures, and coma are often associated with advanced uremic encephalopathy. Peripheral neuropathies are common in advanced uremia. Both the sensory and motor tracts are involved. The lower limbs are initially affected. The patient can develop restless leg syndrome. Paresthesias and sensory loss typically occur in a stocking glove pattern. As uremia progresses, motor function is impaired causing muscle weakness, decreased deep tendon reflexes, and gait disturbances. Hyperphosphatemia and hypocalcemia associated with uremia stimulate parathyroid hormone secretion. Parathyroid hormone causes increased calcium resorption from bone. In addition, osteoblast and osteoclast cell activities are affected. This bone resorption and remodeling combined with decreased vitamin D synthesis and decreased calcium absorption from the GI tract 
lead to renal osteodystrophy, also known as renal rickets. Osteodystrophy is characterized by osteomalacia, softening of the bones, and osteoporosis, which is decreased bone mass. Bone cysts may develop. Manifestations of osteodystrophy include bone tenderness pain and muscle weakness. These patients are at an increased risk for spontaneous fractures. Accumulated waste products of protein metabolism are a primary factor involved in the effects and manifestations of uremia. Serum creatinine and BUN levels are significantly elevated. Uric acid levels are increased as well, which can contribute to an increased risk of gout. Tissues become resistant to the effects of insulin and uremia, leading to glucose intolerance. High blood triglyceride levels and lower than normal high density lipoprotein levels contribute to the accelerated atherosclerotic process. Reproductive function is affected, pregnancies are rarely carried to term, and menstrual irregularities are common. Reduced testosterone levels, low sperm counts, and impudence affect the male patient with end stage renal disease. Anemia and retained pigmented metabolites cause pallor and a yellowish hue to the skin in uremia. Dry skin with poor turgor is a result of dehydration and sweat gland atrophy. Bruising and excoriations are frequently seen. Metabolic waste not eliminated by the kidneys may actually be deposited in the skin, contributing to itching or pruritus. In advanced uremia, high levels of urea in the sweat may call what we, or cause what we call a uremic frost, which is actually crystallized deposits of urea on the skin. Early management of chronic kidney disease focuses on eliminating or controlling factors that may cause additional kidney damage and further decrease renal function. In diagnostic testing, this is used both to identify chronic kidney disease and to monitor kidney function. There are a number of tests that can be performed to determine the underlying renal disorder. Once the diagnosis is established, renal function is monitored primarily through blood levels of metabolic waste and electrolytes. A urinalysis will be performed in order to detect abnormal urine components. Again, in chronic kidney disease, the specific gravity may be fixed at approximately 1.010 due to the impaired tubular secretion, reabsorption, and urine concentrating ability. You may also see abnormal proteins, blood cells, and cellular cast can be noted in the urine. A urine culture can be done to identify any urinary tract infection that may hasten the progress of chronic kidney disease. BUN and serum creatinine are obtained to evaluate the kidney function and assess the progress of renal failure. A BUN of 20 to 50 signals mild azotemia. Levels greater than 100 indicate severe renal impairment. Uremic symptoms are seen when the BUN is around 200 or higher. Serum creatinine levels of greater than 4 indicate serious renal impairment. Glomerular filtration rate is used to evaluate and stage chronic kidney disease. The GFR is a calculated value determined using a formula that includes the serum creatinine, patient's age, gender, and race. Electrolytes are monitored throughout the course of chronic kidney disease. The serum sodium may be within normal limits or low because of water retention or impaired sodium conservation. Potassium levels are elevated but usually remain below 6.5. Serum phosphate is elevated and the calcium level is decreased. Metabolic acidosis is identified by a low pH, low CO2, and low bicarbonate levels. The CBC will reveal moderately 
severe anemia with a hematocrit of 20% to 30% and a low hemoglobin. The number of RBCs and platelets are also reduced. Renal ultrasonography is done to evaluate kidney size. In long-standing chronic renal failure, kidney size decreases as nephrons are destroyed and kidney mass is reduced. A kidney biopsy may also be done in order to identify an underlying disease process if it is unclear as to why the chronic kidney disease is occurring. It is also used to, useful in identifying an acute process from a chronic failure. Kidney biopsy may be performed in surgery or done percutaneously using needle biopsy. Chronic kidney disease affects both the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic effects of drug therapy. Most medications are excreted primarily by the kidney. The half-life and plasma levels of many drugs increase in chronic kidney disease. Drug absorption may be decreased when phosphate binding agents are administered concurrently. Proteinuria can significantly reduce plasma protein levels, leading to manifestations of toxicity when highly protein-bound drugs are given. In addition, any potentially nephrotoxic agent is avoided are used with extreme caution. Drugs such as meparidine, metformin, and other oral hypoglycemic agents eliminated by the kidney are avoided entirely. NSAIDs, which can cause a further decline in kidney function, are also avoided. Because the kidneys are the primary route of magnesium excretion, again, any magnesium-containing antacids and laxatives laxatives are avoided in chronic kidney disease. Also, patients who use any aluminum hydroxide products need to avoid these as well and stop using them as it can start causing signs and symptoms that appear like the signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's after long-term use in chronic kidney disease. ACE inhibitors and ARBs have been shown to reduce proteinuria and slow the progression of chronic kidney disease and are often used for this purpose. Diuretics such as furosemide or other loop diuretics may be prescribed to reduce the extracellular fluid volume and edema. Diuretic therapy can reduce hypertension and cause potassium wasting, lowering serum potassium levels. Other antihypertensive agents, particularly the calcium channel blockers, such as diazem and verapamil, are used to maintain the blood pressure within normal levels, slow the progress of renal failure, and prevent complications of coronary heart disease and cerebrovascular accidents. Patients with chronic kidney disease have a significantly increased risk for cardiovascular disease and premature death. Other drugs may be used to manage electrolyte imbalances and acidosis. Sodium bicarb or calcium carbonate may be used to correct mild acidosis. Oral phosphorus binding agents such as calcium carbonate or calcium acetate are given to lower serum phosphate levels and normalize serum calcium levels. Phosphate binders such as Renagel may be used as alternatives to calcium containing products. Drugs that can promote potassium retention such as um, potassium sparing diuretics, NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs are eliminated if measures such as dietary potassium restriction fail to prevent hyperkalemia. If the serum potassium rises to dangerously high levels, a combination of bicarb, Insulin and glucose may be given intravenously to promote potassium movement into the cells. k which is a potassium ion exchange resin, can be given either orally or rectally. Folic acid and iron supplements are given to combat anemia associated with chronic renal failure. A multiple vitamin preparation is often prescribed because anorexia, nausea, and dietary restrictions may limit nutrient intake. Epigen or Procrit 
are given to stimulate red blood cell production in patients with chronic kidney disease who are severely anemic. These drugs are not without risk, however. Hypertension is a common adverse effect and adverse cardiovascular events such as stroke and thromboembolism have occurred. A significant increase in hemoglobin and hematocrit levels are usually not seen for two to three weeks after epigen or procrit are started. Higher hemoglobin levels, more than 12 grams per deciliter, and higher doses of epigen are associated with a higher rate of thromboembolic events and increased of risk of death from serious cardiovascular events. The recommendation is to use the, use the lowest dose possible to treat the anemia. These patients are checked each time they come in for their doses to see where their hematocrit and hemoglobin is at. And if they are at 12, the dose may be reduced or held. Maintaining adequate nutrition and preventing protein calorie malnutrition are the focus of nutritional management during early stages of chronic kidney disease. As renal function declines, the elimination of water, solutes, and metabolic waste is impaired. Accumulation of these waste in the body leads to the uremic syndrome and symptoms. Dietary modifications can slow the progress of nephron destruction, reduce uremic symptoms, and help prevent complications. Unlike carbohydrates and fats, the body is unable to store excess proteins. Unused dietary proteins are degraded into urea and other nitrogenous waste, which are then eliminated by the kidneys. Protein-rich foods contain inorganic ions such as hydrogen ion, phosphate, and sulfites that are eliminated by the kidneys. A daily protein intake of 0.6 to 0.75 grams per kilogram of body weight or approximately 40 to 50 grams per day for an average male provides the amino acids necessary for tissue repair. The majority of proteins should be of high biologic value, rich in the essential amino acids. Carbohydrate and fat intake is increased to help maintain energy requirements and provide approximately 35 kcals per kilogram per day. Sodium intake is regulated to help manage hypertension and maintain the extracellular fluid volume at normal levels. Sodium is restric restricted to 3 grams per day initially or to 2 grams a day if necessary to control hypertension and prevent heart failure. More stringent sodium restriction may be necessary as the renal failure progresses. Unless hyponatremia is present, the patient is instructed to drink adequate water to prevent thirst. The patient is also instructed to monitor their weight daily and report any weight gain in excess of 5 pounds over a 2-day period. In stages 4 and 5, intake of potassium and phosphorus is restricted. Potassium intake is limited to less than 2 grams per day. The patient is cautioned to avoid using salt substitutes, which typically contain high levels of potassium chloride. Intake of phosphorus is limited to 800 to 1,000 milligrams per day. And foods high in phosphorus, to keep in mind, include eggs, dairy products, and meat. When pharmacologic and dietary management strategies strategies are no longer effective to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance and prevent uremia, dialysis or kidney transplantation is considered. A number of considerations affect the choice of long-term treatment. Hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis each have advantages and disadvantages. Establishing vascular access for hemodialysis may take several months. Planning ahead to develop the access before dialysis is necessary and can ease the transition. Established access is not a consideration for peritoneal dialysis. The peritoneal catheter can be placed and treatment initiated as soon as it is indicated. 
When dialysis treatments will be performed at home, initiating instruction before it is required can result in more effective learning. If a family member will serve as a dialysis helper, training begins prior to the onset of uremia. If transplantation is considered, tissue typing and identification of potential living donors can be done prior to the onset of end-stage renal disease. To make an informed decision, both the patient and the potential donor need to understand the risks, benefits, and options available. If the decision for transplant is made early, dialysis can potentially be avoided. The patient's age, concurrent health problems, donor availability, and personal preference influence the choice of renal replacement therapy. Dialysis is the movement of fluid and molecules across a semi-permeable membrane from one compartment to another. Clinically, dialysis is a technique in which substances move from the blood through a semi-permeable membrane into a dialysis solution or dialysate. This is used to help correct fluid and electrolyte imbalances and to remove waste products in kidney failure. It can also be used to treat drug overdoses. The general principles of dialysis is that when the solutes in water move across the semipervial mem membrane from the blood to the dialysate or from the dialysate to the blood in accordance with concentration gradients. The principles of diffusion, osmosis, and ultrafiltration are involved in dialysis. Diffusion is used to move solutes from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration. In kidney failure, urea, creatinine, uric acid, and electrolytes move from the blood to the dialysate with the net effect of lowering their concentration. RBCs, WBCs, and plasma proteins are too large to diffuse through the pores of the membrane. Osmosis is the movement of fluid from an area of lesser concentration to an area of greater concentration of solutes. Glucose is added to the dialysate and creates an osmotic gradient across the membrane, pulling excess fluid from the blood. Excess fluid is removed by creating a pressure differential between the blood and the dialysate solution. Ultrafiltration, which is water and fluid removal, results when there is an osmotic gradient of pressure gradient across the membrane. In peritoneal dialysis, excess fluid is removed by increasing the osmolality of the dialysate with the addition of glucose. In hemodialysis, the gradient is increased, or excuse me, is created by increasing pressure in the blood compartment or decreasing pressure in the dialysate compartment. Peritoneal access for doing peritoneal dialysis is obtained by inserting a catheter through the anterior abdominal wall. The catheter is about 60 centimeters long and has one or two Dacron cuffs on its subcutaneous and peritoneal portions. The cuffs act as anchors and prevent the migration of microorganisms down the shaft from the skin. Peritoneal dialysis is currently used by approximately 5% of those who require long-term dialysis. Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis is the most common form. Dialysate, approximately 2 liters, is instilled into the peritoneal cavity and the catheter is sealed. The patient can then continue normal daily activities emptying the peritoneal ca cavity and replacing the dialysate three to five times per day. No special equipment is needed. A variation of this is continuous cyclic peritoneal dialysis, which uses a delivery system during nighttime hours and a continuous dwell during the day. This Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis can be performed anywhere and the continuous cyclic peritoneal dialysis allows for home treatment at night, leaving the patient free during the day. 
Peritoneal dialysis has several advantages over hemodialysis. Heparinization and vascular complications associated with an AV fistula are avoided. The clearance of met metabolic waste is slower but more continuous, avoiding rapid fluctuations in extracellular fluid composition and associated symptoms. More liberal intake of fluids and nutrients is often allowed for the patient on peritoneal dialysis. While glucose absorbed from dialysate can increase blood glucose levels in an individual with diabetes, regular insulin can actually be added to the infusion to manage this. The patient on peritoneal dialysis is better able to self-manage the treatment regimen, reducing feelings of helplessness. Major disadvantages include less effective metabolite elimination and the risk for infection with peritonitis. Peritoneal dialysis may not be effective for large patients with no residual kidney function. Metabolic complications with peritoneal dialysis are common, including weight gain, hyperglycemia, and hypoproteinemia. Absorption from, of dextrose from the dialysate can add several hundred calories daily, while albumin and other proteins are lost across the peritoneal membrane. And finally, of course, the presence of an indwelling peritoneal catheter may cause a body image disturbance. And remember that these patients cannot um, submerge in bath water, they cannot go swimming, and they cannot um, use a hot tub because of the risk of infection um, when they have these catheters present. Vascular access must be obtained prior to the initiation of hemodialysis. Arteriovenous fistulas and grafts are two of the types of access that can um, a patient can receive. A subcutaneous arteriovenous fistula is usually created in the forearm or upper arm with an anastomosis between an artery and a vein. The fistula allows arterial blood to flow through the vein. This allows the vein to become arterialized with a much larger caliber and thicker walls which can sustain being stuck over and over again. The arterial blood flow is essential to provide the rapid blood flow required for hemodialysis. As the arterialized vein matures, it is more able to um, withstand repeated venipunctures. This maturation takes six weeks to months. AVF should be placed at least three months prior to the need of hemodialysis. You should be able to feel a thrill when you palpate the area of anastomosis and hear a brewy when you listen with the stethoscope. The brewy and thrill are created by arterial blood moving at a high velocity through the vein. AVFs are more difficult to create in patients with a history of severe peripheral vascular disease, those who have had long prolonged IV drug use, and obese women. For these indications, a synthetic graft may be required. Arteriovenous grafts are made of synthetic material and form a bridge between the arterial and venous blood supplies. Grafts are placed under the skin and are surgically anastomosed between an artery and a vein. An interval of two to four weeks is usually necessary to allow the graft to heal and mature, but some centers can actually use it earlier. Because the grafts are made of artificial materials, they are more likely than AVFs to become infected, and they also have a higher tendency to be thrombogenic. When AVG infections occur, they may require actual surgical removal of the graft since it is difficult to completely resolve any infection from a synthetic material. Surgical creation of an arteriovenous access for hemodialysis has several risks including the development of distal ischemia known as Steele syndrome and pain because too much of the arterial blood flow is being shunted or stolen from the distal extremity. Classic manifestations are pain distal to the access site, numbness or tingling of fingers that may worsen during dialysis and poor capillary refill. 
Aneurysms can also develop in the arteriovenous axis and can actually rupture if they are left untreated. You are never to perform blood pressure measurements, insert an IV line, or do any venipuncture in the extremity with the vascular axis. We take these precautions to prevent blood um, infection and clotting of the vascular axis. In some situations, when immediate vascular access is required, catheterization of the internal jugular or femoral vein is performed. Long-term cuffed HD catheters are often used for temporary vascular access. These catheters provide temporary access while the patient is waiting for a fistula placement or as a long-term access when other forms of access have failed. This type of catheter exits on the upper chest wall and is tunneled subcutaneously to the internal or external jugular vein. The catheter tip rests in the right atrium. It has one or two subcutaneous Dacron cuffs that prevent infection from tracking along the catheter and anchor the catheter, eliminating the need for sutures. Advanced planning is essential for management of the patient with kidney failure who is approaching end-stage disease and the need for dialysis. Enough time is needed for evaluation and consideration of the best arteriovenous access for HD and also for preparation for pul um, peritoneal dialysis. The dialyzer used for hemodialysis is a long plastic cartridge that contains thousands of parallel hollow tubes or fibers. These are semi-permeable, made of cellulose-based or other synthetic materials. The blood is pumped into the top of the cartridge and is dispersed into all the fibers. The dialysis fluid is pumped into the bottom of the cartridge and bathes the outside of the fibers. By this, ultrafiltration, diffusion, and osmosis occur across the pores of the semipermeable membrane. When the dialyzed blood reaches the end of the thousands of semipermeable fibers, it converges into a single tube that returns to the patient. Dialyzers differ in regard to surface area, membrane composition and thickness, clearance of waste products, and removal of fluid. Two needles are used for hemodialysis. They are very large bore, usually 14 to 16 gauge, and are inserted into the fistula or graft to obtain vascular access. One needle is placed to pull blood from the circulation to the HD machine, and the other needle is used to return the dialyzed blood to the patient. The needles are attached via tubing to the dialysis lines. If a patient has a catheter, the two blood lines are attached to the two catheter lumens. The needle closer to the fistula, which is the red catheter lumen, is used to pull blood from the patient and send it to the dialyzer with the assistance of the blood pump. Heparin is added as it flows into the dialyzer because any time blood contacts a foreign substance, it has a tendency to clot. Blood is returned from the dialyzer to the patient through the second needle or the blue catheter lumen. In addition to the dialyzer, a dialysate delivery and monitoring system is used. The system pumps the dialysate through the dialyzer, counter current to blood flow. Dialysis is terminated by flushing the dialyzer with saline solution to return the blood to, in the extracorporeal circuit back to the patient through the vascular access. The needles are then removed and firm pressure is applied until the bleeding stops. Before treatment is started, a complete assessment needs to be done on your patient. We need to look at their fluid status, which includes weight, blood pressure, any signs of peripheral edema, lung, and heart sounds, the condition of the vascular access, temperature, and general skin condition. The difference between the last post-dialysis weight and the present pre-dialysis weight determines the ultrafiltration or the amount of weight or fluid that will be removed. While the patient is on dialysis, vital signs are taken at least every 30 to 60 minutes. 
or per facility protocols because rapid blood pressure changes can occur. Complications of hemodialysis include hypotension. Um, this can occur because of the rapid removal of vascular volume, um, decreased cardiac output, and decreased systemic vascular resistance. The patient may start complaining of lightheadedness, nausea, vomiting. They can even have seizures, um, vision changes, and the chest pain from cardiac ischemia. The treatment for this hypotension is by decreasing the volume of fluid being removed and doing an infusion of saline solution or albumin. Muscle cramps are also a complication and can occur. Um, with the development of the muscle cramps, it can include in hypotension, hypovolemia, high ultrafiltration rate and low sodium dialysis content or solution. Cramps are more frequently seen in the first month after initiation of dialysis than in the subsequent period. Treatment includes reducing the filtration rate and administering fluids to the patient. There can also be blood loss that can result from the blood not being completely rinsed from the dialyzer, an accidental separation of the blood tubing, a rupture of the dialysis membrane, or bleeding after the removal of needles at the end of dialysis. If the patient has received too much heparin or has clotting problems, post-dialysis bleeding can be significant. It is essential to rinse back all blood and closely monitor the heparinization to avoid any excess anticoagulation. Hepatitis used to be a big concern and at one time hepatitis B had an unusually high prevalence in dialysis patients, but now the incidence is very low because there are lower transfusion requirements because of the new screening and recommendations for vaccinations, this incidence has been lowered. However, there are outbreaks that still occur since transmission is attributed to breaks in infection control practices. Currently, hepatitis C is responsible for the majority of cases of hepatitis that are seen. Continuous renal replacement therapy is an alternative or adjunctive method for treating acute kidney injury in some of the critical care units. It provides a means by which uremic toxins and fluids are removed while acid-based status and electrolytes are adjusted slowly and continuously in a hemodynamically unstable patient. The patients selected are usually those who do not respond to dietary interventions and drug therapy. The principle of continuous renal replacement therapy is to dialyze patients in a more physiologic way over 24 hours, just like the kidneys. It is contraindicated if a patient has life-threatening manifestations of uremia that require rapid resolution. There are various types available and the type used will depend on what the needs of the patient are. The vascular access is achieved through the use of a double lumen catheter placed in the jugular or femoral vein. The advantages of this therapy is that it is continuous rather than intermittent. Large volumes of fluid can be removed over days versus hours. Solute removal can occur by convection. There's no dialysate required in addition to osmosis and diffusion. It causes less hemodynamic instability and it does not require constant monitoring by a specialized hemodialysis nurse, but does require a trained ICU nurse. It also does not require complicated hemodialysis equipment, but a blood, blood pump is required or needed for the venovenous therapies. Kidney transplants have become the treatment of choice for many of our patients with end-stage renal disease. Kidneys are the solid organs most commonly transplanted and to date kidney transplantation is the most successful of all the transplantation procedures. 
Kidney transplant improves both survival and quality of life for the patient with end-stage renal disease. Most transplanted kidneys are obtained from deceased donors. However, transplants from living donors are increasing. With both deceased and living donor transplants, a close match between blood and tissue type is desired. In general, a match of ABO blood group is necessary. That is, the donor and the recipient must share the same blood group. Human leukocyte antigens are compared between the donor and the recipient. Six antigens in common are considered to be a perfect match. The success of well-matched living donor transplants is better than for deceased do donor organ transplants. Close tissue matching probably accounts for the better outcome with living donors. People with normal kidneys are in, who are in good physical health may donate a kidney. Pre-donation counseling is vital. Although a laparoscopic approach may be used to remove the donor's kidney, there is a risk that trauma or disease may damage the remaining kidney in the future. If the transplant fails, the psychological impact of the, on the donor can be significant. Ideally, deceased donor kidneys are obtained from people who meet the criteria for brain death, are less than 60 years old, and are free of systemic disease malignancy or infection, including HIV, hepatitis B, or C. Expanded deceased donor criteria may allow donation of a kidney from a deceased donor who is older than 60 or who has cardiovascular disease. Kidneys are removed after brain death has been determined and are preserved by hypothermia or a technique called continuous hypothermic pulsatile perfusion. A kidney preserved in this way is transplanted within 24 to 48 hours. Continuous pulsatile perfusion allows up to three days before transplantation. The donor kidney is placed in the lower abdominal cavity of the recipient and the renal artery, vein, and ureter are anastomosed. The renal artery of the donor kidney is connected to the hypogastric artery and the renal vein to the iliac vein. The ureter is connected to one of the recipient's ureters or directly to the bladder using a tunnel technique to prevent reflux. Unless the donor and recipient are identical twins, the grafted organ stimulates an immune response to reject the transplanted organ. Immunosuppressive drugs minimize the response. These drugs suppress a portion of the immune system and the inflammatory response, increasing the risk for infections and cancers with long-term therapy. Glucocorticoids such as prednisone and methylprednisolin are used for both maintenance of immunosuppression and to treat acute rejection episodes. Side effects of long-term corticosteroid use include impaired wound healing, emotional disturbances, osteoporosis, and Cushingoid effects on glucose, protein, and fat metabolism. Even with immune suppressive therapy, the transplanted kidney can be rejected at any time. Either acute or chronic rejection may develop. Acute rejection develops within months of the transplant, and it is caused by a cellular immune response with T lymphocyte proliferation. Few manifestations may be apparent other than a rise in serum creatinine and possible oliguria. You may also see chills, fever, hypotension, headache, and possibly pulmonary edema if the patient is oliguric. Chronic rejection, which may develop months to years following the transplant, is a major cause of graft loss. Both humoral and cellular immune responses are involved in chronic rejection. It does not respond to increased immunosuppression. The presenting manifestations of chronic rejection include progressive azotemia, proteinuria, and hypertension. These are the same symptoms as you see with progressive renal failure. Hypertension is a possible complication of kidney transplant resulting from graft rejection, renal artery stenosis, or renal, renal vasoconstriction. 
Patients may develop glomerular lesions and manifestations of nephrosis. Hypertension and altered blood lipids increase the risk of death from myocardial infarction and stroke following transplant. Long-term immunosuppression also has adverse effects. Infection is the continuing threat and the number one cause of death for transplanted patients in the first year. Tumors are common with carcinoma in situ of the cervix, lymphomas, and skin cancers being the most prevalent. And the risk, of course, of congenital anomalies is increased in infants whose mothers have undergone immunosuppressive therapy. Therefore, it is recommended that if it's someone who is of childbearing age and has a transplant, that they do not become pregnant. The corticosteroid use can also lead to bone problems, gastrointestinal disorders, and cataract formation. Nursing care of a transplant recipient pre-op phase includes emotional and physical preparation for the surgery. Because the patient and caregiver may have been waiting years for the kidney transplant, a review of the operative procedure and what can be expected in the immediate post-op recovery period is necessary. Stress that there is a chance the kidney may not function immediately and dialysis may requi be required for days to weeks. And review the need for immunosuppressive drugs and measures to prevent infection. In ensuring the patient is in optimal physical condition, they will have an EKG, chest x-ray, and lab studies. Dialysis may be required before surgery for any significant problems such as fluid overload or hyperkalemia. A patient on peritoneal dialysis must empty the peritoneal cavity of all dialysate solution before going to surgery. Because dialysis may requ be required after transplantation, the patency of a vascular access must be maintained. The vascular access extremity should be labeled to prevent use of the affected extremity for blood pressure measurement, blood drawing, or IV infusions. Postoperative care for your live donor is usually the same as that of someone who's had an open or laparoscopic nephrectomy. You must closely monitor their renal function to assess for any impairments and monitor the hematocrit to access, access for bleeding or assess for bleeding. Donors actually experience more pain after an open nephrectomy than a laparoscopic procedure. Generally, all donors have more pain than their recipients do. Donors who have an open surgical approach are ready to be discharged from the hospital in four to five days and can usually return to work in six to eight weeks. With a laparoscopic approach, the donors are discharged from the hospital in two to four days and can return to work in four to six weeks. The donor is seen by the surgeon one to two weeks after discharge. The recipient, their very first priority during the period is maintenance of fluid and electrolyte balance because very close monitoring is required. Kidney transplant recipients spend the first 12 to 24 hours in the intensive care unit. Very large volumes of urine may be produced initially after the blood supply to the transplanted kidney is reestablished. The reason for this is due to the new kidney's ability to filter BUN, which acts as an osmotic diuretic. The abundance of fluids that are administered during the procedure and initial renal tubular dysfunction, which inhibits the kidney from concentrating the urine normally. Urine output during this phase can be as high as one liter per hour and will gradually decrease as the BUN and the serum creatinine levels return back to normal. Urine output during this time is replaced with fluids milliliter for milliliter for the first 12 to 24 hours. Central venous pressure readings are essential to monitor postoperative fluid status. Dehydration must be avoided to prevent subsequent renal hypoperfusion and renal tubular damage. Electrolytes are monitored as well to assess for hyponatremia and hypokalemia that is often associated with the rapid diuresis. Treatment with potassium supplements or infusion of normal saline may be indicated. IV sodium bicarb may also be required if the patient develops metabolic acidosis from the delayed kidney function. 
Acute tubular necrosis can occur because of prolonged cold times causing ischemic damage and the use of marginal cadaver donors. While the patient is in acute tubular necrosis, they may require to have dialysis to help maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. A sudden decrease in urine output in the early postoperative period is a cause for concern. It may be due to dehydration, rejection, a urine leak, or obstruction. A common cause of early obstruction is a blood clot in the urinary catheter. Catheter patency must be maintained since it will remain in the bladder for three to five days to allow ureter bladder anastomosis to heal. If blood clots are suspected and ordered by the healthcare provider, gentle catheter irrigation can be done to reestablish the patency. We have already discussed immunosuppressive therapy and it is very important that you make sure that your patient understands their drugs and why it's important that they continue their treatment with the drugs. We've talked some about the complications of transplantation. Um, rejection is the biggest. You can have the hyperacute, which occurs in the operating room immediately. The acute and the chronic has already been discussed. We've already discussed the other complications of transplantation. Um, as well with infection, cardiovascular disease, malignancies. They can actually have recurrence of their initial kidney disease, um, such as certain types of glomerulonephritis and immunoglobulin A nephropathy um, can cause um, reoccurrence. And of course, we've already discussed the corticosteroid-related complications that can occur as well. Thank you.